Hello and welcome to this Aim High Live. Um, this is about um, static electricity. This one's about high school physics. So um, yeah, if you've come to a few of the other ones of these, this is part of a series where we're covering all the high school physics electricity syllabus. So actually, we're getting quite a long lot of the way through. We're nearly actually nearly done, I reckon. Um, certainly have starting to head in that direction. Uh, anyway, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm just going to quickly say hi to people in the in the chat because there's quite a few people here. Omnipus is here, Japan Maple is here, Zainon is here, Oliver is here. Um, thanks for all coming. Uh, so we're going to start, uh, just while people are arriving, with this. So this is the sun, um, and someone asked me this... Some, um, it's a, it's a student of mine who asked me this question um, about whether, about what would happen if you were like right next to the sun. So if you were right next to the sun, would you freeze or would you burn up? What would happen if you were right next to the sun? Would you freeze or would you burn up? And I'll just write a little thing here. Would you freeze or burn up close to the sun? What do you guys reckon would happen? So yeah, close to the sun, would you freeze or burn up? Um, now, the context for this, in case don't, you don't already know, is that um, outer space is about like minus 270 degrees C, approximately. So that's the temperature of outer space. And then obviously the sun is, is as hot as the sun. Some would say hotter. Um, Okay, so what do people think? So, uh, Posey Joe's here as well, and Vendable Sugar saying hi. Also, Frostbite, hi all. Um, Creon the Sleepy, burned, <coughs> burn freeze, like freeze burn. <laughs> um, and quite a few people are saying burn. Uh, Oliver's saying, are you in a ship? Because if not, you would suffocate. Okay, so you're not in a ship, you've just, um, you're, you're, <laughs> Okay, you're in like a space suit, but it's like quite a thin space suit. Um, and you've got, got some oxygen to breathe from within your space suit. Um, Posey Joe's saying, would you feel like you're freezing, but actually just burn? Um, and Omnipus saying you'd freeze either way because it would be like a heat burn or a freeze burn. Uh, okay, Xenon's saying you wouldn't feel anything because you'd die from lack of oxygen. So if you do have oxygen... Um, Okay, Japan people are saying it's like at high altitude when it feels cold, but you can get sunburn. Okay, so this is um, this is a really important point, um, is that at high altitude, you're getting sunburn even though it feels cold because the intensity of the radiation from the sun is much, much greater because you're not protected by the atmosphere. And so uh, the first point is that you are going to be getting crazy hot in this scenario. Like this scenario is going to be making you really, really hot because of the radiation from the sun. Um, I, I brought this up because someone told me that they read somewhere that if you were close to the surface of the sun then you would freeze before you would burn up and that's not true. Um, you would burn up, so those who said burn are correct, because you're getting all this radiation heat from the sun that's going to make you really really hot and then sure, the, sure space is cold but even though it's, um, even though space is really cold like you can't, you're not, you won't actually lose very much heat to space. Why do people think you won't lose heat to space, even though it's minus 270 degrees C? We're really used to the idea that if you touch a cold object, then you get really cold. But why does space, which is minus 270 degrees C, why does that not make you cold when you're when you're in, when you're touching it when you're out in space? What do you guys reckon? Um, and while I'm waiting for people to say what they think, um, I will just say another late welcome. Thanks so much for coming. If you're joining late, this is the name High Live. We are doing high school physics today, so this is very much on syllabus. Although I'm just starting out with this question, which is not on syllabus <laughs> um, because it's fun. Um, and then I'm going to explain to you how static electricity works in a way that is hopefully much uh, that's hopefully really simple and helps you to understand it. If it's been something that you've struggled with before, because I felt like it was taught. It was. It was. Well, to be fair, I had really good science teachers at school, but um, maybe through, probably more through my fault, I didn't learn it very well at school, what static electricity was. But anyway, now I do, so I'm going to explain it to you. Um, okay, there's no, okay, so Japan Maple's right with saying there's no particles to take the heat. Japan Maple's also saying the spacesuit would get sweaty. Yeah, it would do. It would very much get sweaty. Um, and does the temperature of the sun... Uh, cross out the temperature of space. No, it's not a cancellation thing. So Xenon, that's how we that's how we kind of think about things on Earth, isn't it? Is that like if the if you're in contact if there's something hot around and something cold around, we think of them as cancelling out. But actually in space it's more about 
where you can get how the heat transfers. So the, the sun is transferring loads of energy, heat energy to you really quickly through its light, and that's called radiation transfer of heat energy. But then you're not losing much energy to space because even though space is really cold, there's no particles in space to take the heat away from you. Normally, if you touch a cold thing on Earth, then all the particles inside your hand that are vibrating really fast give all their energy to the cold thing, and that's why your hand gets cold. But if you, there's nothing to touch in space because it is empty, so you can't lose heat space. Um, and Zainal is saying, are the radiations UV? So the radiation that gives you heat would generally be um, infrared and a bit of visible red. So it's kind of like that red area of the spectrum is the one that gives you heat. UV um, is, a higher, is higher energy than, than these, but it doesn't transfer its energy to us in the form of heat. It transfers its energy to us in the form of um, basically like exciting the electrons inside your body, which is a bad thing because it, it, it leads towards um, skin cancers and stuff like that. Um, anyway, so... Uh, Japan Mobile is saying, so when I'm warm, I'm actually just vibrating. Yeah, exactly. All the particles inside you are just vibrating when you're warm. Um, uh, okay, so let's go down to the next bit. Here is a cat and a ladle. Um, and this, uh, so I'm going to, uh, well, I'm going to show you how, how static electricity works. So who... Who knows what, who, who here has experienced static electricity before? Um, what, and when you experience it, what, what, what is it like? Would you be blinded by the sun? I think Posey Joe is asking, and you would be blinded by the sun if you were that close and you were looking into it for sure. Um, so static electricity is like a pinch or like a pain. And yeah, on the, on the trampoline, so anything, so it'll be like plasticky surfaces you often pick it up from or wool or something like that. And it, and it, it makes your body charged in a way that when you touch other things, you'll go, you'll get like a ping, like a spark of electricity flying. And sometimes you can actually see the electricity moving. Um, okay, so I'm gonna demonstrate how this works with this cat and this ladle. Um, it doesn't have to be a cat and a ladle. It just has to be any two materials that do not conduct electricity. So everything that we've been doing so far about like electricity has been with metals because metals conduct electricity. But static electricity only works with things that don't conduct electricity. So it's kind of like the other end of the spectrum of all the electricity stuff we've been doing before. Right, so if you take this cat and you rub it up and down the ladle like this, um, then you will start to build up static electricity for the cat and the ladle, who knows why? What is it that's happening when you rub the cat against the ladle? Zainal's saying that, her, that your dad got a really bad one once and literally couldn't move, the, move their finger. Um, yeah, static, sometimes static electricity um, bursts can be really bad. Um, okay, so friction, it's charging it. Um, it is to do with friction, so as you rub the cat against the ladle, you're getting like, an element of friction going on. That's great. Um, and Japan Maple is saying, I think it's transferring some kind of energy. So it's transferring some kind of small particle. What kind of small particle is it transferring? <laughs> One million slots is saying that the cat will poof up. And it will. The cat's hairs will stand on end if you keep rubbing it on the ladle. Exactly. Okay, so most people are saying electrons. And it is electrons. It's electrons because they're the smallest ones. Remember when we looked at an atom before? It's got the big nucleus in the middle with the protons and the neutrons. And then the electrons just kind of around the outside. So the electrons are the easiest ones to move um, because they're so small. And so as you rub the ladle against the cat, the ladle is going to transfer electrons to the cat. And so you're going to find that the cat is going to be covered in a thin layer of electrons. So your whole cat is going to be covered in a thin layer of electrons. And your ladle is going to have lost a, little, a load of electrons. Now, what does that mean the charge will become on the cat? The cat's going to get a certain charge and the ladle is going to get a certain charge. What do you think the charge of the cat's going to be? What is the charge of the ladle going to be? Okay, so positive ladle, negative cat, brilliant. So the cat's gonna build up loads of negative charge and the ladle is gonna build up a load of positive charge. Perfect. Um, okay, because the ladle has lost a load of electrons, so it's left with a, a deficit. It's got a shortage of electrons because they've all gone over to the cat because of your continuous rubbing of cat on ladle. Um, great, okay, so this is static electricity. This is how it forms. Right, now, this is the key, one of the key things that I never had it properly explained to me, uh, and I say that, and actually maybe it's just my fault for not listening, um, but still, 
I didn't I didn't realize it at the time. But if the cat was made of metal, this wouldn't really work and you wouldn't get static electricity. So let's move over here to these two cats. So I've got a normal cat and a metal cat. So if you if you were to rub a ladle against both of these and you were to cover them both in electrons, then what would be different with the metal cat um, and the and the real cat? How would they respond differently? So Japan Maple saying the metal would use them to carry a current. And it's not quite that the metal would use it to carry a current because it's not a circuit. So it's not it's not it's not a circuit, and so it wouldn't be able to to have a have a current going round. Um, it's because so Oliver's saying it wouldn't work on the metal. The thing is is that what the thing that I didn't get at the time is that static electricity is a surface effect. It's all about what's going on on the surface. So it's about the fact that you've got electrons built up on the surface of the cat. So they're all, they're all stuck here on the surface. It's only the surface of the cat that is negatively charged. Now, if you have a metal cat, you're trying to build up electrons on the surface, but every time you drop an electron on the surface, it just conducts its way into the middle of the cat. And so instead of you building up like a really thick layer of electrons on the edge, like this cat, you just end up with them kind of dotted throughout the cat. And so you don't end up with a nice kind of like overall, overall pickup of charge. Instead, you can kind of like, uh, it, it thins out. It's like the difference between um, taking honey and rubbing it all over the surface of a cat and taking honey and dropping it into a big bowl of water. In the bowl of water, the honey would all dissolve and spread out and become very thin. But if it's all on the surface of the, of the cat, then you know the cat is covered in honey. You know what I mean? Um, anyway, so static electricity is a surface effect and it has to just be, has to just be like that. Um, now, so yeah, so it means that this, this cat is gonna be negatively charged and then going back to the ladle, uh, the ladle would be positively charged. Right, when, can someone give me an example of a time that static electricity might be quite dangerous or quite a big problem? Ah, Drop Bear Antics has just asked a great question about what if we assume that the metal cat is hollow? And so if it's hollow enough and the surface layer is, is thin enough, then you would be able to get a static electricity effect. Uh, okay, so Creon the Sleepy is saying when I want to open a door, it could cause a problem. Xenon is saying it could cause a fire uh, when it's too strong. Okay, so Posey Joe is saying planes. I'm gonna talk about um, Planes, because planes is a classic place where this happens, right? If you have a load of, um, if you're fueling, I should have got a picture of a plane. <laughs> anyway, if you're fueling up a plane like this, then you will have a pipe and down the pipe, you will have running all of your airplane fuel. And the pipe, ha yeah, so the pipe has all the fuel running down it, but because the pipe has all this fuel running along it, the fuel does not conduct electricity and, and neither does the pipe. And so both the pipe and the fuel are gonna pick up static electricity. So they're both going, so one is gonna end up positively charged and the other is gonna end up negatively charged. So you've got positive pipe, negative fuel maybe. And if this charge gets too big, then as people were saying, it's like, it's like the plane's got a tail. <laughs> um, yeah, if this difference in charge gets too big, then a spark will jump. So it'll be like the, if the charge gets too big between the electrons and the ladle, then it's possible for a spark to jump from the, uh, from the cat to, it could go to the ladle, but actually it's much more likely to go to a nearby metal surface. So if you have like a surface of, of metal over here, then, and it's nearby and the charge on the cat gets high enough, then you could get a spark as the electrons jump over to this metal surface. And you can get a similar thing going on with a plane where if you build up too much static electricity, then you'll get a spark jumping across into the plane fuel and it could ignite the plane fuel and blow up the entire plane and load to the airfield and it could be a total disaster. So that would be bad. Can anyone think of an example when static electricity might actually be a good thing? When could it be useful? It is a Boeing 747. Thanks, Power Maple. Spot on, isn't it? Um, and Vendable Sugar saying that's that why they use an earth wire. Great, okay, so this is something I was gonna do, do in another lesson, but I'll just jump into it anyway. Um, so what you can do is you can attach all of these things to wires that are just plunging straight down into the earth. So if this is the surface of the earth, and then the wire just plunges down into the earth, and the earth will just accept electrons 
So if you've got excess electrons building up on the plane or on the, or on the pipe or something, then they'll just go down the wire and just travel straight into the Earth instead. Um, and vice versa, the Earth can be a supply of electrons as well. So if you've got too much positive charge building up, then the, then the Earth wire can, um, can deliver electrons to balance it out. But basically, think of a wire that goes deep into the Earth as just like a, a, a possible sink or supply of as many electrons as you need to balance out the overall charge. Okay, so uh, there's people talking about starting fires with stone, flint, um, lightning rods. Uh, Nika estimates she's got some breaking news, but it's been censored, so I don't know what it is. Um, anyway, right, so uh, car engines and drop barrier antics is also saying you don't actually need to earth it to the ground. You could also just equalize the potential. So what that means is that you could make sure that you don't have any charge difference between the aeroplane and the pipe and the fuel by just connecting them all together with conductive wires, and that would work as well. Um, so just as long as you don't have a difference between positive charge and negative charge, then you won't get a spark. That is a great comment, drop bear antics. Um, okay, so the example I was thinking of is printers. So a lot of printers work by, um, by basically charging up the paper where it wants the ink to land. And so if you want the, land, if you want the ink to land on this cross, then you charge up this cross with a positive charge. So as it's going over those rollers inside the printer, you suck away a load of electrons so that this bit of the printer is very positively charged. So it's not got enough electrons. And then you spray ink above it, and the ink above it, you do the opposite with. So you statically charge the ink so the ink is full of negative charges. And so when the ink is then flying towards the paper and deciding where to land, so the ink is all like flying in, it'll all land on these bits because this is where it can equalize the positive charge and the negative charge. So the negative charge of the ink gets attracted towards the positive charge of the paper. And so the printer can help to target where the ink is gonna go. And can anyone think of why this is an especially good way of painting cars? So this is, so cars are painted with these kind of spray painting robots. You might have seen those arms where they're just like like spraying the ink all over. Um, can anyone think why this might be an especially good way of painting cars? So again, you'll charge up the car and the car might be positively charged. And then you will spray it all over with negatively charged ink. Why would this be such a good way of painting cars? So Olive is saying because it's easier than humans, which is true. Um, Creon is saying because they don't really miss, and that's also true because it's attracted towards the car. But there's some other brilliant advantage to this. Vendable Sugar is saying, does flint and steel use static electricity? And I don't know the answer to that. I don't think it does. I think it's just a frictional effect, but I'm, I might be wrong on that. Um, so Poster Joe is saying because it sticks to the car and doesn't waste the paint, and that's good. Um, Japan people is saying I'm very bad at painting cars. Um, and Oliver is saying so you don't paint the tyres, and that's also a great answer, because you're not going to paint the tyres because they won't be charged up. Um, one million sloths is saying it doesn't waste paint. So all of you are kind of getting there, but no one's actually got the main reason why this is so brilliant. Drop Bear Antics has got it, exactly. Equal thickness of paint. So the thing is, as soon as the paint lands on this surface, this bit of surface loses its positive charge because it's got negative charge on it. And so this bit of surface becomes neutral and it doesn't attract any more paint. So the paint landing on the car makes it less attractive to more paint. And so, so basically the, car, the paint will always be attracted to the least painted bits because the least painted bits will still be positively charged. Um, and so you get a nice, even layer. So even if it's a human painting it, it still helps a lot to have a positively charged car and a negatively charged paint because then it will all land evenly across the surfaces. Um, great, okay. Oh, we just got two, two spam people asking if we want to buy followers. <laughs> great, <laughs> I love a good spam bot. Um, okay, so, uh, I, so that, that's static electricity, and I was going to finish on that, but I thought that I would um, just do a quick review of the stuff that we were doing the other time. So like we were doing circuits and voltage and current, and if you weren't there for that, don't worry about it. Um, this might be quite hard if, for some of you if you weren't there, and some of you might find it easy, but I'm going to give you um, uh, a test to see how much stuff you remember. So let me just move over here. 
Um, <laughs> Japan Maple saying, we've made it now that we've got bots. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> That's what it's all about. It's all about reaching the bot standard. Um, okay, so if you've got an 18 volt battery and this 18 volt battery is running through these resistors. So let's give it a three ohm resistor and a six ohm resistor. Now, some of you will um, maybe have missed this and that's okay, but if you have a voltmeter here, oops, it's too pale a green. If you got a voltmeter here, so measuring the voltage across the six ohm resistor, then what will it be? And if you've got a voltmeter here, so measuring the voltage across the three ohm resistor, then what will it be? So this is number one and this is number two. What do you guys reckon each voltage will be? Now, to remind you, um, if you have 18 volts, think of the voltage as like spending money for the circuit. So the elect so the current is going around the circuit. And remember, current, we always say, goes from positive, so that's the big end of the battery, to negative. So it goes from the positive all the way around to the negative. So it goes anti-clockwise in this, in this circuit, from the positive to the negative. That's what we always say current does. And all the rules of the whole of physics are based on that. But actually, we know that in reality, it goes the other way because electrons are negative. So they come out of the negative end, which is confusing. But whenever you're thinking about current in physics, you always tell her it's coming out of the positive end. Anyway, so we got the current comes out of here. It's got 18 to spend. How much will it spend here? And how much will it spend here before it gets to go back to the battery again? Um, so what have we got? We should have for number... And Nidex is saying, sorry, I'm late. Nidex, you missed the whole bit about static electricity, but now we're just doing a quick review of current and, and, uh, and voltage. Okay, so Venable Sugar is saying 12 and 6. So you would get, I'm just going to get rid of all this stuff so that I can draw some more stuff in a moment. There we go. So you would get 12 volts here and you get 6 volts here. Um, so to re-explain that to you, you've got 18 volts to spend. And so on the way around, you're going to spend six here and 12 here because this one is doubly hard to get through because it's double the resistance. Double the resistance, double the effort to get through it. So you need double the voltage to make it happen. Um, OK, cool. Right. So that's um, that's great. Now, what if what would the um, next thing I want to know is what would the current be? So if you were to drop an ammeter here. So an ammeter, remember, if you missed it, an ammeter is measuring the current. Then what would the ammeter be reading? What do you think? Now, for those who are not sure, remember that voltage equals current times resistance. The voltage is the current times the resistance. So look at a single resistor and think, what is the voltage and what is the resistance? So therefore, what must the current be? And Nidex is being told off for going all caps. <laughs> it's Maggie's late as well. Um, so while people are working out what they think the current will be, um, I will just very... I just want to really, really quickly show the people who were late what the key idea is. Key idea is static electricity. You take two insulating things, so two things that don't conduct electricity, like a cat and like a plastic ladle, rub them against one another, and one gives electrons to the surface of the other. And it's really important that it's the surface. So this cat gets covered in a surface of electrons, so it becomes negatively charged, and this ladle becomes positively charged because it is, uh, it's had all its electrons removed. That's the key idea. Once you've built up loads of electrons on your surface, if you go next to something metal, you might get a spark jumping between you and the metal because those electrons might want to jump away from you. Or if you're the ladle, you might get electrons jumping towards you. Um, that's the key idea of it. Anyway, going back to this because we're going to run out of time. Uh, so Dropbit Antics is saying two amps, right? So And people are correcting it to two. Yes, very good. So you'd get two amps forming here um, because that way you would have, um, yeah, 12 volts. So 12 volts equals two amps times six ohms would be this bit here. Brilliant. Okay, cool. Right, now let's make this a bit more complicated. I'll give you all um, one final test on this stuff. Um, can we go down from here? No, we can't. Right, so let me grab 
everything from here. And I'll just, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. Actually, I'll just draw it in small below. Okay, so now I want you to consider that there's another arm that's got a two ohm on it. And also I'm gonna squeeze into the bottom here another one with a one ohm resistor and a three ohm resistor. This is really hard. I'm just gonna give you one that's really, really hard just to see how much you can all calculate. So we'll just have a go at doing as much of it as you can and then I'll ask you loads of questions. So what I want is um, voltage number one here Voltage number two across that one, voltage number three across this one, and voltage number four across this one. So what would those different voltages be? And Japan Mill is saying, oh no, you're confusing me. Yeah, I've really just thrown something really, really difficult at everyone to see what happens um, for, for the end, <laughs> end of the lesson. So remember, you've got 18 volts. 18 volts is, you've got 18 volts to spend. If you go this way, so if you go this way around, how much can you afford? Ooh. If you go this way around, how many volts can you afford to spend on this resistor before you can then go back to the beginning again? How many volts can you afford to spend on V1? So I wanna know what the voltage at one is, what the voltage at two is, three and four. Okay, suppose you're just saying V1 would be six. So V1 would be 18, because if you're starting here with 18 volts to spend, then you get around here, and you can spend 18 volts at this resistor and then you can come back to the beginning again. So the last one I wanna do is, is I wanna know what the voltage here will be, here will be, and here will be. One ohm, three ohms, and two ohms. So Japan Maple is saying voltage one is 18 volts, great. And then three, nine, and six. This is Japan Maple's answer. Um, so let's just go over that together to make sure this works. So Japan Mobile is saying we're getting up three volts, nine volts, and six volts at the bottom. So you've got 18 volts to spend going around this loop of the circuit. So you've got to spend 18 volts across all three of these before you can go back to the beginning again. Um, and three, nine, and six, they all add up to 18. So that's great. Um, so the next question is why are they split three, nine, and six? And they're split like this because this one is three ohms and this one is one ohm. So this one's three times harder to get through. So it needs three times the voltage. So that's why this one gets a voltage of three and this one gets a voltage of nine. And this one is two times as hard as this one to get through. So it has a voltage of six. So that is perfect. Anyway, um, I think that was quite a hard question to end on, but I'm really glad that, um, that some of you managed to get it. And I'll keep coming back to voltage and current because it's really hard. Posey Joe loves the word triply. Um, so uh, yes, uh, I will, ooh, let me show you this. So obviously I showed you this coming up next week. So do come along to that if you are free um, and tell your friends about that. And then the other things coming up next week are these. Um, maybe I'll slip these on the other side actually. Yes, yeah, so these, the, these are the questions that are coming up next week. I'm doing Are We Breathing in Plastic on Monday. And then on Tuesday, we've got Why Millions of People in China Invisible? Why do beavers have so many eyelids? Beavers have so many eyelids. Um, and Hannah Bolland is going to do How Do We Treat Cancer? And then Nish is going to talk about how you can trust, how can you trust your moral beliefs? Um, and then, ooh, this is down as me, but I'm not going to teach that one. I need to change that. That's Josh teaching that one. Anyway, so thanks all for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and do spread the word and follow our social media. And if you haven't already and you're watching on our website, which is here, then do go here to check out more of the calendar that's coming up, but also go here and, and fill out the survey so you can tell us like whether you thought like, what you thought we could do better and stuff, because that's really good information for us to make this better for you guys. Um, so don't worry if you don't have time, but do do that if you get a chance. It's just below the live stream. Um, and Japan Mill is saying, I've helped you understand the unit so much. That's great. Um, glad to hear it. Uh, okay. Oh, Creon the Sleepy has started spamming us. That's strange. I thought Creon the Sleepy was a real normal person. Anyway, um, so yes, thanks all for coming. Have a good weekend. See you next week. Farewell.